Hey, this is Ross Payton with Roleplay and Public Radio. This is RPPR episode 103, School of Dice. In this to- in this episode, we will be talking about academic topics, both in the game, in the game, uh, the meta game, and uh, using the game to teach people uh, the game. So, all kinds of scholastic topics. It's just a grab bag yeah. of uh, well academia. Anyway, speaking of stuff I've learned, Ross, when you did the announcer voice this time, yeah. I, it's it's a fascinating thing to watch you do it. This time it's like I, it's kind of felt like your your throat had to just clench up to hey, this, your voice rises so much. I worry that you're like strangling yourself with your own neck muscles. <laughs> All right, and with me as always is Tom Church yeah, and I, a special guest Caleb. Uh, you can't deny I'm wrong, Caleb. Uh, I, I have a theory. There was a take before this where we messed up. Yeah, and it was just kind of an explosion of announcer voice. Yeah, I think he saves it up in between episodes, <laughs> and that if if it gets the pressure gets too high, right, we and we reach peak announcer voice. <laughs> it's, it's like an emergency release valve. Yeah, yeah, it's like a it's like a steam blow on a coal power pump. <laughs> All right, <laughs> and like and much like that, it's really really noisy and annoying. It's going to be my obituary off. someday. <laughs> announcer voice uh, build up. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, that's how they got the movie announcer guy. I think that's a, that, that, that's a <laughs> recognized So uh, before we get into the main topic, we do have a bit of news, of course. Uh, Gen Con is coming up uh, as of this recording. We will be there next week. Uh, we will be running games, playing games, recording games, panels. Uh, games game panels. will be involved. Uh, just, wow, so many games. Like, so, so many games, you won't know what to do with uh, them. All. So I'm running three games for Arc Dream. Caleb, you're running three games. Yeah, I'm running three games uh we're also doing two three panels or i'm doing two yeah uh we're doing uh money is the root of all fun right economics and games which is not like how to fund your kickstarter but like right how to put economics in your setting and stuff because you've been whoa, focusing whoa, on whoa, that for some reason where did that come from i know Caleb? out of nowhere and then we're doing uh rppr gdw yeah game designers workshop panel yes and there will be a, I'm sure R G D W P. I'm sure there won't be a lot of angry old grognars. Whoa! I thought G D W was back. Yeah, okay. we might need to bring riot shields. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hey! Also for our fan, hey for our fans, uh, Fuzzy Dan will be there this year too. Uh, yes, he the of the uh, I add one to my dark spiral aura from back in the day. Indeed, and he, he has he was Kuthin. Yes, he was Kuthin. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so well, he will be there. So will David, uh, Aaron, of course, and uh, all three of us. Yeah. So. Indeed. And uh, you know the, the monster himself. Yeah, of I I just said I would I would be here. Well, you said you said uh, <laughs> I would said it was running games there at party panels. It's you you could do it remotely, Ross. I I don't think I. Tom could. has an agenda for his comments. <laughs> if you haven't picked up, on <laughs> he's it's not. It's all that gives me life. <laughs> So, uh, this is uh, something I look forward to. Uh, we will, of course, be posting a lot of content after we get back from Gen Con. We'll be trying to get interviews as well, uh, try and get in on some other panels uh, to record them, those that aren't, we aren't yeah. doing. Get some uh, good game sessions Delta recorded. Green uh, is going to, they're going to be a panel on Delta Green uh, that Arc Dream is going to be doing uh, Thursday uh, that I definitely wanted to. Well, actually, they're doing two. Uh, one on Thursday and then one on Saturday, I think, about Tradecraft and Cthulhu, which sounds interesting. There's also someone about Gumshoe. I mean, there's a lot to go with. So we'll try and get as much as we can. So uh, that's that's something to look forward to. And uh, if you're already going to Gen Con, uh, we have uh, some instructions on the RPPR message board. Uh, go to General Chaos and look for the RPPR Gen Con Meetup 2014 thread. And that there will be information there, including stuff on uh, the RPPR group me. Uh, just set that up so we can coordinate with one another. Uh, although that the texting in that gets pretty overwhelming pretty quickly. Uh, so. Dear God, <laughs> yeah, holy crap! And but that will be how we will be coordinating stuff during the cons, and that seems to be the most convenient and easiest to deal with. Uh, Quick anecdote: I'm glad I bought the extra nice protection case for my phone as Sarah threw it across the room. When people were still texting at midnight. (laughs) Yeah. You need to just have permanent mute on group me unless you actually care. Holy holy balls. Yeah. I'm actually uh, uh, another group uh, for the Something Awful Goons who are going to Gen Con. And there's like 30 people there. And oh, my God. I just like, group me, I don't want to ever text until I give you permission. Just (laughs) mute. All the time, forever. I know I, I, I need it, but I hate it. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah li- literally, my, like my texting chime was like, is this bugging you? Is this yeah. bugging you? Yeah. Is this bugging you? <laughs> so, yay, social media. 
Uh, the other big news is, of course, uh, Nozo Look Behind. The Kickstarter is still ongoing. We made the goal. Congratulations. Thank Kim. you, everyone. Uh, very we, appreciative. We've reached the first stretch goal, uh, and but there are still more stretch goals to go. So, uh, Yes, uh, the $10,000 stretch goal is a additional uh, section of plot hooks that you can use to continue the campaign. Uh, so you could, I don't know, off the top of my head, Enjoy a uh, super villainous, demonically possessed summer professional development seminars or, uh, you know, thrill at the failed resolutions that all teachers make to do over the summer and inevitably do not fulfill. Uh, it, it'll be a blast. Uh, and then there is the uh, 12K, which is the full color, full color hardcover uh, stretch goal, which would be. Totally sweet, uh, and that would be really cool. So, uh, nag all your friends into joining the Kickstarter because I know many of you are faithful and have done so already. Yeah, and I thank you. Yes, Caleb has a darkness. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he wrote it to get yeah. rid of the dark. It was it was exorcism. did it work? Uh, How's the dark? Uh, darkness still? Uh, darkness I try to help you, but no, you just. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, uh, and also in Kickstarter news, I would be remiss if I did not mention that there is also a Horrors of War Kickstarter for Adam Scott Glancy Pagan Publishing. Seven years in the making. Uh, that is going on for another month. So How uh, long did World War One last again? It, it is last, it actually long? Didn't no, it actually take longer to four write? Four years August versus 16 19, years. Four, August 1914. <laughs> it's not that long, Caleb. It was August, but it, I mean, the, the pre-production did last well, longer than by the way, <laughs> August, It was August 1914 to November 1918. Right, August 1, which is when the Kickstarter launched. But yeah. it will be going two months. Uh, their goal, they're already at 10. I'm not worried about them. They're already at 11 grand uh, or something like that, and they only need 16. Uh, uh, I can't wait to read that book, like, yeah. regardless of having played in the scenarios in it. Uh, oh, no, I definitely to want to run this up. Really, adventure. it's just going to be really exciting to read. Uh, like, yeah. Ross, falling is a bad thing for you. That's why I'm running the adventure. I can't die if I'm not. My character's <laughs> not in the game. Uh, I can just make you die. All of you, 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 you. Uh, I will roll for your character. Now. A lone airman named Bigglesworth will land it, <laughs> <laughs> covered uh, in the ichor of no, slain you've the, those entities. The, the, the zeppelins are flammable back then, so Aaron will inevitably ignite <laughs> the entire thing. Trying to create a lightning gun or something. Exactly. <laughs> so so uh, this is something you look forward to. Um, Tesla coils. We will be our we, our goal is to record a new another World War One scenario with Glancy uh, during the con, and we will of course post that as soon as we get back. Uh, so we will have a lot more about it after the con. I'm sure we'll be able to talk to Glancy, and he can go into detail. Uh, my only. Caveat is uh, if you're going to the back end, it does not have a PDF level because the co author, John Crow, is a Luddite who is afraid of e piracy, so there is no PDF option. Uh, you could try and mass email him, but I do not know if he has email out in his cabin in the Arctic wilderness. Uh, he, Attach your comments to pigeons. Yes. <laughs> Whisper his name in their ears and set them north. <laughs> like, send the ravens. Uh, so Send the raven to, ha- ravens to House Stark. <laughs> he will eventually be made to, re- re- to uh, listen to reason, but until then, uh, take a look at it. It it uh, does look like a, a good deal. I, I will be looking forward to the book as well because I can't wait to uh, uh, read it myself uh, and get that beautiful Zeppelin uh, diagram uh, as one of the, which is one of the rewards I think. Uh, Give us that beautiful Zeppelin footage. Exactly. So anyway, uh, scholastic stuff in games. Uh, this is of course vaguely connected to No Soul Left Behind, but learning and school and education are actually big topics in basically every RPG because what uh, what else do experience points represent but a character's uh, learning how much they have learned how much they have uh, uh, figured out or kill depending on what well that, I mean that's the sort of gameism is the mm-hmm. whole I've been killing orcs for three months now I'm be- not only better at sword work I'm tougher but I speak elven you know because I've been killing so many orcs or I can cast more powerful spells because I've been killing orcs and it's always orcs yeah well isn't it am yeah. I wrong yeah so I, I, I there's a lot to go here, uh, go through here. And I, uh, first I just, you know, want to think in terms of 
what games get educational learning right as a practical matter. Uh, do you think any? Do you guys think if, uh, do any games out there currently on the market get them right? Because most games either after either they do the level, you know, you need so many experience points to level up, or you get one to three or five points that you can then spend on individual skills. Uh, with no bearing on it. Um, then there's, of course, like Hackmaster, which I brought up, because the new version of Hackmaster says you not only have to get enough experience points to level up, but then you actually have to go to a school and learn. And uh, at this school, you will have to make roles, and you will have to, you could have encounters, you could make friends or enemies, you go to a crappy school, you might have to convince a mentor to actually teach you, uh, which I thought was a really cool idea, because that, that sort of makes it into an adventure oh, of great. itself. I got the University of Phoenix yeah, Academy exactly. of Magic. Yeah, <laughs> Uh, you would be so screwed when you walked in that yeah. dungeon. <laughs> a bunch of goblins eating your corpse. That wasn't even accredited. <laughs> exactly. What a dummy. Like, so, dude, he's, uh, dude, he's got a tier four magical school. Um, that, so I really like that in Hackmaster. And I'm tempted, if I ever do a fantasy campaign, I'm probably going to institute that regardless of system. Um, I don't know when I'm going to do another long fantasy campaign, but uh, I think, I think I, I, I'll keep that in mind. Uh, so, but you guys, what, I mean, in terms of just first surveying what systems are out there, do you think any systems out there get the experience or the process of learning right or even close to it? I can't think of an actual, I can't, can't think of a single system that's done that. It's, most of the time, well, I, I mean, like, well, when I think it works is I prefer the, I really kind of prefer the point, you know, point based. Right. But at the same time, every game I played like that, there's always been a, uh, okay, you get three character points. Like, okay, well, I, I want to bump this skill. Well, did you use that skill at all? Like, well, no. Right, there then, is that. You can't, then you can't really do that. That's, it's really more kind of ho like ho you know, house rule stuff that I've done. Right, like, I mean, the only system that I can think of off the top of my head that actually reinforces the things you actually do in the game are the ones you get better at is Call of Cthulhu. Which mm -hmm. is, uh, I think, a ad I, th I mean, well, it's a remarkably elegant actually, system. Uh, uh, actually, um, Cyberpunk does that, too. Yeah. Well, the problem with Cyberpunk is you actually have to record every single time you successfully use a skill. Yeah, that, that's... That's a lot of freaking... Yeah. Uh, Dungeon World, you get an experience point for every time you fail oh, yeah. a skill roll, uh, as I <laughs> did not remember until, like, the very last time I read it. Yeah. But. Uh, but yeah, but in Dungeon World also, you did, then you do have that, that disconnect between what your character's actually done and learned, and then you just get a new suite of powers, and you get to choose which one it is. So it could be like, I remember in Dungeon World, I was like, oh, we got a magic item. Suddenly I'm an enchanter at level two. I can know, I understand what this item does, you know, instead of having any in-game process about that. So Yeah, I mean... The thing about education in games is that we talk about like modeling and abstraction for games. Yeah. And it will not be fun in any instance if you do not abstract it. So I think the systems that do it well do abstract it, but they abstract it in a way that hasn't been done before because I think that lends verisimilitude to the idea of education in the game because it's just so particular. You can demarcate the demarcations into minor demarcation. Like, Topics become to subtopics, which become subjects and sub subjects right. and sub sub subjects. I mean, uh, think about like all the stuff that a role playing game leaves out of what actually occurs in a fight or makes up about what except actually. Phoenix Command. Occur except Phoenix Command. <laughs> but even Phoenix Command, if there were a game about teaching a soldier about how to do those things, you would take all of the information to see Phoenix Command and then combine it with the family history of your entire character's whole life, his genetics and his neuropsychology, and it would just be... Not, like If there were a game of teaching people, it would be on Dark Souls level difficulty <laughs> and, and roughly that uh, depressing. But at the same time, when... <laughs> When you did achieve victory, you would also shout and scream and rage at the gods that you yeah. have defied, uh, like you do when you, you taught beat a, Dark Souls. You taught a private with ADHD how to clean his gun. <laughs> Success! Six yeah. levels! Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you, you have to abstract it, but I, I find like systems that do it in unique ways, particularly like uh, Aces is Eights. I like that the only way you get better at gunfighting is don't die in a <laughs> gunfight. Gun like, that's another good point. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's really good. Because like that would be something that would make you better at gunfighting in that you would be 
not keen to do it again. Yeah. But that's a very important lesson to learn in gunfights. Well, it's also, I think, you wouldn't, like, if you survive a gunfight, you wouldn't. Like, the main thing that historically has been the problem with people who have never been in a gunfight is that they, as soon as it starts, they freeze up. They don't. They panic, and they don't know what to do. And if you've gone through that trial by fire, you're not going to, like, instantly seize up because it, you can call back on your memory and be like, oh, yeah, I should duck. I should get to the ground. I should not stand in the middle of the street, you know, or something yeah. like that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Fun fact, that old uh, two guys shooting across the town square yeah only ever only ever happened once yeah most of the rest of the time in the old west it was whiskey and guns or what caused most gunfights well those two guys were probably drinking in the middle of the street i mean why else would they be out in the middle of the street shooting at each other i assume no, a was, lot of it, alcohol is involved it was like no I'm, I'm not gonna go into it <laughs> you're just wrong <laughs> no, and also no. you live in the city where it happened yeah all right Anyway, uh, but but yeah, uh, so so there's that. Or you look at like eclipse phase where you get res points, and it's got a remarkably um, kind of slow progression system. Yeah, considering the you know being a deep percentile system, the maximum you can get per an adventure is like seven, and then oftentimes it's an adventure, not a session. So there's that. But then you also look at eclipse phase with the rep and credit system. And you just buy skillware to get forty points in something like so. It's very economically based. It's very reputation based, which is also I cannot stress enough the influence of economics on learning anything, which you know is going to be just right. the what? default system in red markets. Wait, what are you would, saying? Education would you like costs to, money? Yeah, would you like to do something better? Pay to do well, it's it. Also, better. things like nutrition. You know, if you can't afford to eat very. You know, no, there's food. there's a staggering number of just logistical concerns yeah. for learning anything at all. So, like, I think the key to a good advancement system that is trying to mimic education yeah. uh, is paradoxically not to try and mimic education, right? But to try and mimic one of the endless variables that affect education as right. well as possible, because that's going to give it the feel of that sensation far more than you know if you were to be an insane school teacher slash game designer and you know try and make every part of your job you know into a gameable thing right. in right. addition to having a game where you go kill orcs and yeah. steal their we stuff we did a session and I killed myself right <laughs> well I mean uh, I would just want a system like for me my stands are just to avoid the gameism thing the whole killing orcs I speak elven that, that, that disconnect is very sort of <laughs> Like, I can understand being better at killing orcs if you've been killing orcs, because, hey, that, that makes sense. But, like, uh, that's, again, why I think Call of Cthulhu has a very yeah, like, the a, positive yeah. reinforcement. Yeah, you level up the shit you use. Yeah. And I think, uh, certainly, when I get... I really wish I could have read that text that warned me the Night Gaunt was coming. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. You would you would want to brush up yeah. afterwards. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, so that... Uh, but talking about that, um, we also have... Uh, the idea of the school in the setting. So like in Hackmaster, again, you have schools and academies that become adventure hooks because you either have to you know qualify to get in, you have to pay to get in, you have to convince a teacher to take you on as a student, you have classmates who can be allies or enemies. You were uh, in detention with a bunch of people from totally different cliques than you are that, and suddenly... Literally every, every adventuring party yeah. in the existence. And of, you suddenly bond and you leave mm, better people. Right, the... the Orc slaying club. Uh, so, um, <laughs> the but yeah. The orc, so talking about the orc uh, brunch club. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, so for me, that's probably what I would do if I was going to. Uh, and then you could synergize it by incorporating the rules. So again, I, that's why I'm looking at Hackmaster, sort of an interesting standard to look at. Um, but do you think a lot of games? What kind of games would you want to see more? I mean, obviously, No Soul Left Behind is pretty much, you know, as school-based yeah. as you can get. Yeah. But do you think other games could benefit from that? I mean... Um, I do, and I think some are. So I think uh, Night's Black Agents, uh, yeah. uh, a highly recommended source of solace for everyone is their mentor. Like, yeah. who taught you to be a spy and is now retired? And right. I think that's, like, a really good idea because it's going to bring role-playing about right. and things of that nature. Uh, monsters and Childs things obviously are, yeah. are using the setting thing to the hill. But the thing about the school setting is that when you think about it, everyone in the world has gone to some version of school. Right. Uh, and 
when you really get down to it, it's a wildly differing experience for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you are with a gaming group, which is probably somewhat homogeneous just based on your geography, right? Uh, you all have that shared experience. It's part of the national purpose of education is to have that shared touchdown experience. So you can make almost the most any craziest gonzo setting more relatable by putting a school in that setting. That's a really good Like, point, yeah. it is a great way to introduce people to a new strange world because they're going to have that default purpose and structure set out. Now, I mean, when you really look into it, and if you want to get, you know, with new uber nerdy education policy wonk, you know, game group, like, yeah, schools look nothing like what you are probably imagining in your head listening to the podcast. Like, a Paul Paulo Freer's uh, radical communist inquiry groups of the <laughs> South American revolutionary favelas yeah. do not look like your high school. They don't yeah. worry about cliques. They yeah. worry about how should we learn to overthrow the <laughs> the bourgeoisie. Like, but... Uh, but that's the kind of thing, like translating that sort of thing in, into your setting is, is, and you can take what you want from it. Like if you want to make a dark setting somewhat more lighthearted, you could take it down the school, like Gotham Babies or stuff. I've, right. I've seen drawings of that. But at the same time, like if you want a grim dark setting to get grim darkier, like every societal problem on earth affects children, and those kids go to school, and they drag that stuff in, like you know. You have all sorts of stuff going down on, on, on a level. And if you want to convince your players to go kill that gang in town, show them the school where mm -hmm. that gang runs the town. Like, and they will be sharpening knives and preparing <laughs> their daily spells in minutes. You know, so I, yeah. I think a setting can make uh, a setting that involves a school or has something like that. It's a cultural touchstone you can use to sort of introduce even your wildest, craziest setting ideas. I mean, yeah, no, that's a really good point. I mean, uh, Tom, uh, I know you, you tend to run a lot of crazier, like, sci-fi operas and yeah, type, sorry, type of games. Uh, have you have you tried to use this technique in the past? Like, yes. um, Actually, one time, um, I was... Uh, it was Star Wars, actually, back when I still played that. Yeah. And uh, they decided that they wanted to do a, uh, like, a Jedi game, which is... I was actually running this. And oh, Jedi Academy? Well, it was, they wanted to play Jedi, and I'm like, oh, God, I don't want to play that. <laughs> but then I decided, okay, yeah, Jedi Academy. Like, not the 10-year-olds. Right. But more like, you know, the teenagers right. in, in that setting. Where, you know, essentially, it's, you don't have, like, it's, you don't have the, you know, the, 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 you know the, the leniency of the younger kids. Right. Like, things are actually expected of them. Well, they also have you. some force powers. Yeah, by yeah but, yeah, things are actually expected of them. Right. But also, they're not. They don't have the authority of full-on Jedi. Right. That's the only way I could. I, I really. That was a game that I wanted to run. But actually, they you know they they enjoyed it. Yeah. Because it's you know, because you know they're it, they're not playing full-on you know respectable Jedi. They're basically playing teenagers. Right. That are hoping to be cops, basically with magic. <laughs> magic wizard. Magic yeah, wizard, wizard cops. Wizard space cops, wizard basically. cops. Uh, Space Wizard Cop Academy. I mean, mm -hmm. is a great, Which, great. And it was great because also, like, you know, like, like, well, how do I keep them together? Like, like, well, simple. Their teachers tell them they have to work. <laughs> You're together. assigned. To, yeah, it's group work. Everybody you, yeah. hates group work, so that's a great dynamic there. There's a lot of tension there. Uh, and, yeah, and also they couldn't go do what they wanted. It also allows you to introduce that, like, the, a lot of the sort of uh, if you wanted to get into the like, the esoteric mysticism of the Jedi, mm -hmm. which is kind of lost in a lot of games, I would, hey, what better way than literally teach it to them? Or, like, you could have them, they go on field exercises where they have to demonstrate one aspect of the Force, like mercy or whatever. I don't know. I mean, like, there have been a ton of cartoons and novels and comics set in Jedi Academy. And, uh, and it's also kind of weird. Most players actually... All just seem to automatically bring that teenage angst. I don't like other people thing with them. Weird. I know <laughs> it. It works so well. like there's like I had one one other. I had them like on a on a barren asteroid where they yeah. had to stay for like a week. Yeah. And survive, using nothing but their wits and meager supplies. And I didn't role play it the whole. I didn't role play the whole time. But the moments I did. Oh my god! Like the bickering because you know one player would like he I've got an idea like like I don't know that's stupid like no 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 my idea is good <laughs> and, like, and I'm like well like they took right to that didn't they yeah 
Nothing I got to do. Yeah, exactly. You can just sit back and let the fireworks uh, go. Um, you know, for me, one of the, oh, well, did you? Have, oh well, yeah, yeah, you can go. Um, for me, one of the other ideas I had is aside. <laughs> I mean, I mean, that, and that's a great way of showing like a, a more out there concept mm-hmm. is you know figuring out hey here's the Jedi here's how they work uh, through the Jedi Academy. But I had another idea recently. I uh, finished a book called Misquoting Jesus, which is basically a primer. On biblical textual criticism. Textual cr- criticism is, of course, focused done poorly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, it's the field of basically looking at old manuscripts and figuring out what the original thing was. Because the earliest texts we have of the Bible are basically two to three hundred years after Christ, you know, after Jesus was supposed to have died. So, like, we don't, we don't, re- we have, and everything was copied by hand back then, so that shit was, you know, from one scribe to another scribe and another scribe. Like, like, do we, do we have the, the uh, notes from the Council of Nicaea? Yeah. Do we? Um, I, yeah. But, no, what, what my point is, like, so scribe A would, like, miscopy something because he was looking you know he, he had a brain fart or whatever scribe b hated that particular passage so he rewrote it scribe c was a heretic and like wanted to rewrite it to reflect gnostic wisdom you know or the gnostic uh and no theology. matter what version it is so yeah and uh and so on and so forth so we have a copy of a copy of a copy and so like and that's a fascinating field. So for, for me, it gave me the idea of, obviously, a Cthulhu Mythos-type game where, like, do textual criticism with Necronomicon or something like that. But as an academic setting for a game, like, you could have graduate students, like someone, uh, everyone's a graduate a student of someone, you know, you know, Dr. Armitage at Miskatonic U, and be like, yeah, no, here's five folklore texts. Compare them. Figure out what the real ritual, what the original ritual was supposed to be. Because we have five copies of the ritual. We don't know what the original is. And naturally, as yeah. as as classmates, we're going to get along just fine. Yeah, and not exactly. have our egos get into it. So you could have uh, everything from like primary, you know, uh, kindergarten or well, not kindergarten, but maybe like elementary school, where things are very regimented to um, high school, sort of in the middle to like postgraduate software characters have a lot more initiative but they still have those kind of goal posts that they still trying to get good uh good grades make friends you know uh a lot of social and professional stuff going on and then of course with the cthulhu mythos stuff and then you you know try not to die or go crazy and uh so that's yeah. another way yeah. and i think what you're talking about from a game design perspective is about mirroring the puzzle and the lesson both at the table physically yeah and because uh, you'd need handouts to do any kind of game like that. I, oh, I can't yeah. imagine without handouts. Mirroring that and then what's going on in character. So, like, if if listeners recall the, the No Evil Heist game, yeah. we had the planning session, and that's, that's, that's sort of that. It was sort of an intellectual puzzle that people were dealing with as Ross, Tom, and Caleb were on the table, right. as well as Bartleby and Preston, like, pouring over... You know, uh, in top dicks yeah. of uh, <laughs> the bank. Um, so that that's one way to do it. That's like really labor intensive, but it's yeah. like really rewarding right. because you are directly mirroring what the players are doing. Like that's one of the few things you can take out of a fantasy world and bring it is the academic, yeah, uh, intellectual content. Yeah. Um, and if your group's really into that, that's and you go through the time to engineer that as a game master. Uh, that is like a super rewarding session. Yeah, it is. Uh, and there's a lot of different ways you could do this. I mean, you could do it through like one thing Bill did. Um, he he ran some D and D playtests for us uh, this su- earlier this summer, and he had great ideas for like introducing puzzles. Which he would say, "Here's a puzzle of dwarven runes. In order to do this, here's an actual puzzle that he just gave us a piece of paper to do that." And uh, he was like a mastermind thing or something like that. Some other kind of Sudoku type puzzle. And so you can kind of abstract it or conceptualize it a uh, uh, very easy way. So you could say this puzzle equals that in the game. Um, and so there's a lot of ways of getting these kind of uh, utilizing more than dice rolling and uh, role playing. Anyway. Yeah. To, to step back to the character advancement thing. Yeah. And, and it sort of goes in the making of the setting because you need an NPC. Yeah. Another way, if you want to represent a character's advancement in a certain subject uh, in the story as well as on the character sheet, make them teach someone else. Oh. Uh, when, when teachers say that I learn more from them than they learn from me, yes, part of it is the cliche, like, <laughs> oh, yes, they give my life meaning and they're all cute and stuff. That's <laughs> definitely in there. But part of it's in there is like, I, I wrote many an article and published many a thing before I was teaching, and I couldn't tell you where an indirect 
object went in the sentence with a gun to my head because the practicality that has for your average day of writing roughly equals in at zero. Right. But I have to know that not because I necessarily am going to drill that into my kids' heads as opposed to more important lessons like uh, considering your audience. When they and, ask you questions. Yeah. But when they ask questions, yeah. I need to know that kind oh, of yeah. like deep knowledge. Like, there's there's an amazing amount of knowledge about things you are experts in that yeah. you have completely forgotten and you don't realize yeah. until you teach somebody else. If you want an example of this, think about any onboarding procedure you've ever been through at a job. Like, when has the orientation ever been even mildly sufficient to teach you to how to do the job? And when has it been people being like, oh, yeah, you should probably do that. Oh, you didn't do this? Why didn't you do that? Because I didn't tell you to do it at all? That happened never ago. Yeah, like, because people have completely automated that. Like, and that's that's one of the things you have to de-automate processes that are automatic. Like, teaching reading is infuriating because like <laughs> it's like a combination of 86 processes that you've gotten to where you can do it automatically but you have to teach people to break it down into individual steps especially if they're struggling with it so that's another way to show character advance and give them little timmy morality pad who needs to learn how to fence and then make their <laughs> character explain how they did it. Uh, another other way you could do it is kind of like cherries in Knights Black Agents. Yeah. Like if you want some specific but benefit from doing a skill, maybe you have to do a little vignette with your character recalls the first time they did that skill well. Because I think we can all relate to like, yeah. I know I can relate the first thing I got published and the first story I wrote, like things I'm passionate about, I, I can sort of flash back very quickly to the moment that got me there. And that makes it more player facing and helps them build the world. And Night Spike Agent kind of does that with like uh Techno Thrill Monologue talks about like talk about your time at the range where you hit a bullseye with this really sweet gun you're using. Like uh and also I'm a forger. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, also I'm a forger. Uh yeah. See, that would be perfect for a character like Tom's forging sniper, which made no goddamn sense at all. Because when he did those miraculous things that made no sense at all on a character sheet being together, I would have really liked a couple of lines of narration <laughs> flashing back to how he came to be that improbable collection of skills. Like, well, to be honest, that happened because I just chose the I chose the cobbler class because we already had a couple of combats, but I was also not dumb enough to not put shit into fire shooting because that yeah, was going to happen so much. <laughs> yes, but that's what you did at character creation, and then we played 12 sessions. Yeah. You could have come up with something. <laughs> you never asked. <laughs> I, I did. Yeah. I know. On many occasions. <laughs> it was brought up during the campaign. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I really like the idea for using, um, teaching an NPC how to do it. Because, uh, I mean, also, like, that's a really good scene for a sort of, like, a Socratic dialogue sort of session. Or, like, for a role-playing thing. Because, like, I know when teaching, like, students will, they're like sharks. They seek weakness. And, like, they, they, will, they will test the waters to see if you know as much as you claim to know. And they will ask these questions. Not because they actually want to know, but they want to see if you you know lose if, you your have shit. The, if you have yeah. the answer and so they try and trip you up and certainly i could love to see scenes like that where like you're especially like an eclipse phase or a nice black agent game where you're trying to explain okay you're the person i have to protect we have to get you across the border so you need to do this this and this so we don't get detected like why not why do i have to do that that's stupid why don't we just walk across the border why can't i use my passport you know blah 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 yeah i mean uh Gifted education, if you study that at all, yeah, uh, I, it has lots of fancy names for it. But just to boil it down, many students who excel, yeah, are, are excel to the point where they get bored and don't excel anymore. Are like academic Conan the Barbarians. Like they will not respect you unless you defeat them in single combat with your brain. <laughs> but once they do, then they're fine learning for you. So that could be like a skill test and, and yeah. things like that. And then if you want to reward your players with like having them shape the world to get all like sappy teacher stuff for a second like there is nothing quite as rewarding as seeing someone younger than you or less experienced than you or a child like better off for having met you like demonstratively like uh, i i tell the story the the reason i decided to teach was was in judo class when i had a student who was terrible and his dad would scream at him every day from the side of the mat and uh 
he asked me one day when his dad was not there on a rare occasion how to do a specific arm bar for a specific attack. And he was so enthusiastic about it and not sobbing for the first time in class that I was thrilled. And we worked all for four hours of judo class on this single arm bar. And the next week he came in, dad didn't yell at him anymore. And dad's arm was broken in the exact specific way <laughs> as that arm bar was. So I'm like, this kid cried and screamed every class because his dad beat the shit out of him. And his dad's arm is broken now, and dad is a lot better. So I'm like, I hope his kid, I'm not naive enough to think this kid's life is great after that, but I'm yeah. like, someone was hitting him and someone is not hitting him. Like, it's pretty powerful yeah. to teach something like that. Like, and if you can give people like that a reward in a setting, like, that's going to get people really invested in their characters really fast. Yeah, no, yeah. I, that's... Or, uh, yeah, helping kids with the homework when I worked at the shelter. Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah, you still talk about that and you don't work at the shelter anymore. No, like, I don't. That's really big. It's, yeah. a, it's like helping with homework where I actually could. I mean, the poor kids, when they ask me, I'm, do, I'm can you help me with my algebra? I was like, no, no, <laughs> I cannot. Uh, but it's like, hey, I have like a like one kid like, hey, we're we're studying American history. Like, go on, <laughs> and I, you know, and it, when a kid was like, it about presidential assassins? Because you totally could have helped them with that. Like, <laughs> well, it's, it's also when I never d- directly gave them the answer, but it's mm. kind of directed them to how to find it. And just yeah. the look on the kid's face when they suddenly realize they found the answer on their own. No, oh, that's. Almost made up for some of the stress of the job, but not quite. <laughs> well, I mean, like, you can use it for anything, though. Like, having read the alpha playtest of Delta Green, yeah. if you would like to, as that game suggests, depress the living shit out of your characters, <laughs> uh, have yeah. them do that and succeed and have it not work anyway. Like, you or know, have the person that they teach then get eaten by a shotgun. Yeah, because that's, yeah, it's going to really <laughs> color the setting uh, of these, like, my, are like in, in Better Angels. Like, yes, you get to see that success and that yeah. improvement, but it creates new problems that you then must address. Like, you've created yeah. a psycho cult of debaters <laughs> <laughs> Mister that have brighter hey. futures, but are also insane now. Like, you know, insanity, <laughs> humanity. That's that's debatable. Uh, they're 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 just different. They're they're not neurotypical. So, <laughs> oh, so, that kid, uh, that kid you taught at leadership camp. Yeah, he's Hitler now. <laughs> uh, I mean, one of the things I I tend to like in games is when I can have NPC assistants or helpers or henchmen or whatever. And so uh, I know as a player, I would like definitely be motivated to teach, you know, uh, Billy Squire or whatever, you know, my NPC henchman is how to be a better badass or whatever. And then that didn't work out so well with Anakin. Yeah. Uh, Well, I mean, it doesn't always work out, you know. Well, Uh, no. Well, I mean, I should give a caveat, though. And and I write this in in Better Angels that um, I I actually call it a a brief note on killing children. Yeah. In which case, I just say don't. Yeah. Uh, and that's pretty much the end of the sidebar. Uh, but he- here's the thing about that kind of stuff: like RPGs are inherently obsessed with violence, yeah, uh, which is just you know kind of the origin of the hobby. Um, war games, uh, but when you bring in um, not necessarily like interns or so, because then that gets to be the running night fail joke of just feeding them into meat right, grinders. Right. But when you bring in children, like people react to it viscerally and with good reason, yeah. like. Uh, I did active shooter training today, and yeah. like you'd be amazed when you sit through those things. How many cool, rational people then are like, "Could we carry guns? When is Missouri going to last carry guns?" It's like, I'm not going to work at a school where people are carrying handguns. Like, yeah. think about the worst teacher you ever had. Now think of them with an armed, fully loaded Glock on their hip. Yeah. Like, why would you want to? Do- or the craziest friend you ever had in high school. Like, yeah. think about a gun. Feet away, well, hey, like the, it's the stupidest it's idea even, imaginable. It's not even malice; it's at, just incompetence. Kale, on one yeah, phrase. exactly. Well, Kale, Kale, yeah. come on, well, Kale, Can't you realize the you know the safety of crossfire? <laughs> well, like your your chances of being shot jump drastically if you bring a gun into your own home. Like yeah. you could be a SWAT officer, yeah. fully trained, and it jumps through the roof. So, like, I'm not like I'm not making a gun control argument here. I'm saying that random people with bachelor's degrees in elementary ed shouldn't be toting around AR-15. Uh, like, uh, so, but that's the thing. The threat, the talk of, like, they get so visceral about that, they just shut down. So, like, if you do it, it should be a major, climactic, 
horrifically emotional like moment in the campaign, right? right? Uh, and it should be, you know, many opportunities to prevent it because, like, otherwise you're going to totally kill the mood at the table because you know people don't like that, right? For for good reason, right? And this applies to children. If you have like you know an adult, like a, a young adult uh, uh, squire or magical apprentice in a D and D type game, yeah, then I think it's a little you know then that's more of a red shirt kind of situation, you know. So I mean, it'd still be tragic or whatever, but certainly, especially in D and D type settings where you can bring people back from the dead, and then it yeah, it be, depends on how fantastical yeah your setting mm-hmm. is. Uh, yeah. And yeah, and but it's definitely something to keep in mind. And, and to be honest, like killing them is sort of like I mean, I would much rather go the Anakin thing where they become like if they can become corrupted or they gain you know uh, or become a rival or something like or that the students <laughs> surpassing the master you know that cliche mm-hmm. which I think I mean I haven't had that in a game happen like organically uh, now I have to set this up now that I have thought about this uh, Caleb how about your character take on some students <laughs> yeah no <laughs> So no, Aaron should be the teacher. That would be the uh, that, that that. Yeah, if you want a character class for me to play yeah. at a game table, yeah. you could pretty much bet the last thing I'm going to pick is teacher. Yeah, It'd be like Harry Dresden playing a magician in this D and D game. <laughs> like, it's not exactly fun for me. I want right. a little bit more escapism. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, but I mean, and, and speaking of learning, I mean, aside from talking about academic subjects in games uh, and how characters learn in the game, uh, you know, just, there's also the idea of using, uh, uh, which you brought up this topic idea, uh, that using the game to teach the game, like a teaching tool. Like uh, for the RPPR, actual play example would be uh, a glorious fall, the first eclipse phase game. I ever ran uh, and posted on the site because I was wanting to make sure I was running it correctly and I wanted to show it everybody else what the concepts were and how the system worked. And so what works best for these kind of situations? I mean, I was going, I was actually very inspired by video game tutorials, which I think, you know, everybody hates video game tutorial levels, but they, you know, video games have to teach you how to play the fucking game, otherwise you're gonna return it, or you're not gonna tell your friends to all go buy Call of Duty, you know. 11 billion. uh, Yeah, Call of Ghost Duty, Mech (laughs) Warrior 5 or whatever, Patriotism on Steroids, Surge Edition. Go America. Actually, I would love to play that game. (laughs) (laughs) All right, fair enough. But you get my idea. Like, games have to be able to teach the player how to play the game, otherwise people aren't going to want to play it. Um, And some games are better than this than others. Like, Payday 2, for example, is terrible about teaching the players how to play the fucking game. It's amazing that people play it. Yeah. Mm, Terrible. But but people play... People play Dwarf Fortress. Like yeah. there, there is a wide level <laughs> of tolerance. This is true. For that oh yeah, we tried to play that once. I, I recall. I played it. It's a single player game. I don't think we ever. Did. I oh, did. I'm thinking of a board game. Yeah. Oh yeah, that was Dwarven Dig, and that Dwarven was Dig, yeah. yeah. Dwarf Fortress is a video game. I played it for three hours. I actually dug a hole. <laughs> <laughs> I got my dwarves to dig a hole and plant some mushrooms. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Whoa, Ross, and go. Then I'm like, nope. That's not for me. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> the the thing about that RPGs have over video game tutorials is that video games have this relentless marketing machine behind them. So oftentimes, before you pick up a game, you know what the game can do, and it's already sold you on doing that thing. So when you go in and you're doing nothing but, like, killing womp rats and kicking chickens when you want to be like legendarily flying through the side with a katana or something yeah the, i think that's why tutorial missions get a bad rap sometimes sometimes they're poorly done but i think sometimes the game has hyped you so much for a certain activity that keeping you from it is, is driving you nuts and that's something that many rpgs don't have to deal with so like when i do better angels in the campaign while all of the all of the Rules and no soul left behind can be used in any single set scenario. Right. The scenario and the plot of scenario focuses on a single aspect of the rules, so that by the time you get to the big bad, you can bring to bear the angelic rules of conduct and big Demi- bad devices. demons and devilish, devilish devices and social combat and all the things that the system does and are really cool and all the rules of the setting. You can bring that all to bear organically if you're someone like Sarah, who's never played an RPG before, 
not to mention something like Better Angels and not read the whole book. Right. So I think that's something that RPGs can do. You can have tutorial missions that none of the players at the table know are tutorial missions, and that's really powerful to yeah. getting people into a game. Especially something as dense as like Eclipse Phase yeah. uh, or something that's, like that. Uh, Eclipse Phase, I mean, literally, I bought Eclipse Phase the year it came out, which I think was like 2009 or 2010. I didn't run it for a fucking year because I was so intimidated by the the sheer complexity of both the system and the well, rules. I, I remember you talking about it yeah, when you were driving that. back. You're like, I'm t- it's like, this is like some heavy shit here. Yeah, no, it was like, I, I knew very little about transhumanism as a movement uh, before then. And just, yeah, I mean, at first you, you open up that book and like, holy shit. Yeah, and we did a whole episode on like, yeah. please play this game. Yeah. Don't run away from it. Yeah. It's amazing. But, yeah, it's just because... And I don't think we would have gotten into it as much as we did if you hadn't have run those yeah, intro to Eclipse ice. Phase yeah. adventures. Um, and then we, we've we seen it go the other way, too, with Night's Black Agents, which I absolutely love. Yeah. But we jumped right into a campaign. Yeah. And then you get Jason four-page comment ranting about yeah. hating gumshoe to the end. Well, it was also Tom, you know, again, making the Forge of Sniper because he jumps into the system cold and that's mm-hmm. that was a failure on my part uh, for not having a tutorial. And I, I, don't think and I, I don't think it was a and failure. And we just had a comment on episode one of Tribes of Tokyo where I was too soft on the players. Because yeah, I, it's too soft to me, that's fine. Yeah, because I didn't and I wasn't doing the rules right because it's the first session I'd run and like... Yeah, and know. no one does. Yeah. But I don't think it was a failure in you because he could have read the book. Like... Yeah. You're not his teacher. He's not six years old. Like, <laughs> you're you're not. A, he's not a ward of the state or anything. Like, it is ultimately as an adult. That's right. your difference from a child. Your ignorance is your own responsibility. Right. Um, but th- that's a result of that. Uh, but here's the thing. I don't think he misunderstands the system at any point this time. But I think there were points he was frustrated at it, and I think that became hate, which right. goes to like one educational truth which might be important for RPGs, there is nothing that will inspire irrational lifelong hatred quite like a bad learning experience. Like, people hate reading. Like, the concept of hating reading is bizarre. Like, right. if you see a TV show you don't like, you don't say, I hate watching moving pictures and then <laughs> throw it out the window. You pick a different genre or things like that. Or if you don't like paintings, like, you don't like paintings. Right. of a, You don't hate art. Like, but the the concept of hating all words on pages is very specific because that's what we teach in school. We don't teach kids to watch TV shows. We don't teach things like that. And if it goes poorly, it's so frustrating. That, or yeah, with, like it, math or drawing. Like, yeah, or math. Yeah, I hate math. I am I'm a person that dislikes math intensely, right. and it's not because like math hasn't done good things in my life. I drive my car like anybody else, but <laughs> it's because I've had, and I had many great math teachers, but. One point, too early in the setting, at the wrong point in my life, I had a bad math teacher. Right. Uh, and I or and I was not it was not easy for me. And the combination of a bad math teacher and it not being easy, that frustration creates a lot of rage in people. No, it does. Um, it does. I think much of the RPG hate that exists for specific editions and specific it comes from a frustrated edu- something didn't come easy to somebody who wanted it to come easy. And they sort of... Uh, or they had you know, one bad session. Yeah, they had some transference, and that became the system's fault. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, and, and those, yeah, the things definitely when you're trying to introduce a system, you know, to new players. Certainly when I do, like, hack... I will be running Hackmaster this fall. I'll also be running D&D Fifth Ed, and I will be running 13th Age. But I will take the time to learn the rules, and I will be taking time to... Uh, do good tutorial adventures probably with pre-generated characters and certainly not jump into a campaign cold with anybody. Um, I mean, but the, the, the other thing is also, like, how do you make a good tutorial adventure? Uh, I mean, Tom, you probably had to teach systems to people. Uh, what have you done for tutorializing a game? Uh, I, I actually had to teach a group of uh, mutants and masterminds. Oh, really? Yeah. That's... Not the easiest. No, I mean it's D twenty. Yeah, they. You're, had, you're they, like Michelle Pfeiffer in Dangerous Minds. It's a hell of an assignment, <laughs> yeah, sir. Yeah. yeah, I. Um, did you even have guide them through character generation? Did I you did. Go, they insisted. Wow. I, I, I brought pregens, but like, no, no, no. We want to make our own guys. 
Okay. Yeah, um, no, yeah, very. Light a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> We're going to be here a while. <laughs> Metaphorically, yeah. Flip the chair around, just sit down. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I, I did have, I did have, you know, at least, you know, the good luck that they knew, the, they knew D twenty. Okay. Even though Mutant Mass Runs is not pure D twenty, it's basically that. <laughs> right. But it's, I, I, uh, I had to, I had to guide, I had to guide them by the hand, and I, you know, the whole like character creation, I, I tried to like, kind of like, I didn't want to. Just, all right, we're just going to sit around here and, lend, I'm, I'm going to tell you about the system. Right. So I. Was, uh, do you, how many copies of the book did you have? Uh, oh, one. <laughs> of course. One copy. So, uh, so basically, I, the first thing I did, I just did a round robin. Like, all right, tell me your characters. Right. And you know, first we did that. I actually had like formal introductions of, or, of our, of the characters, and then I would a- then I asked each other, okay, he's a, what powers do you think he should have? I didn't ask the person. I asked the people around him. Okay. And uh, it. It's a good way to get everybody involved because that's uh, uh, RPG, especially character generations. Mm-hmm. One person's doing a thing, everybody else tunes out. So, like, that's yeah, a good way yeah, to count. Yeah, so, it. I mean, character creation was a whole day. Yeah. But finally, at the end of the day, yeah, at the end of that, the first session was just character creation. Right. And uh, it was basically just going around asking questions and then slowly introducing them to, okay, you know, does everyone know the, you know, the six, you know, the eight stats of right. D20? Sorry, six. Well, six main attributes. I mean, it, six main attributes, and then and if you count the, the saves and the ball, and so I, and you also you also know that it's just, you have your score and the and the bonus and all that, and finally finally got them through and finally the power the power choosing was the worst. I oh. can't imagine how it, it, it being any other way. Like, wow, Mutants of Masterminds cold with one book. Like, yeah, yeah. It, but you got through it, so, we so got everybody through, we, made their characters. Everyone made their characters. They all got through it, and then when it came time for the first session, which next week, I guess the vet, the next week, yeah, I decided to go um, absolutely starting a team from scratch. So they didn't know each other. They didn't know each other, and um, the same time, so just just meeting to get like just meeting together. I, I made sure I had things where they had to use all their skills. All the system stuff. Like I made sure there was a combat that was enough to introduce everything they needed to know, but at the same time, not. You know, I didn't make an RJ character to fight against them. I don't think I've ever posted those APs. Uh, no, but RJ made an overpowered character. An over, a character that basically could not be surprised. Uh, yeah. So anyway. Um, so I mean, I essentially had I had to I had to take the entire session and building the team. Well, you know, I was giving them the lesson of everything they needed to learn. So what were they like? Okay, so combat was a big thing for you to, what other, were there any other highlights that you had like, to like, hit? Um, like, you know, I, they were all meeting up and meeting up in the same place, so I made sure there was plenty, there were plenty of NPCs. Okay. So, you know, first, like, okay, social skills. Uh, so, someone like, uh, you think, like, you know, like, like, who wants to try to, you know, anyone want to try to talk to this guy and be all friendly? Like, all right, all right, well, that'll be diplomacy. And right. talked about that. And this person over here, oh, well. And uh, it's like, well, uh, go ahead and give me like, give me a sense motive check. And he rolls like, uh, succeed. Well, you're pretty sure that guy's hiding something from you. And okay. Then when it, I made sure that there was an opportunity. For combat, social things. Yeah, all this. I, I got all the skill rolls in. Right. Then um, then I made sure yeah, combat covered all the saves. You know, yeah. The different kind of saves they needed to make. And uh, also. I, I actually just printed out a list of all the feats in the game, book, game in the game of what they did because at that point I'm I'm not going to try to make you memorize every feat. That's in book. kind of a weakness of the system itself. There's a lot to go in that system, uh, or especially or also it's even like fifty the, feats something or like. the uh, or the damage conditions. There's all yeah. kinds, and you there's like multi. Yeah, so, no, it, it it gets it's not an easy system to learn. So I actually made uh, I made I made some cards that yeah. had like you know. Like oh you this is a bruised combat condition. Okay. And so you had handouts for I it. Had, I had I had handouts everything. Eventually, as the campaign went on, they didn't need the handouts anymore. Okay, so you you so they so they were learning. How many sessions did you go? You think uh, the game went ten sessions. Ten sessions, that's very and, good. And um, so finally, two of them moved away. Ah. And then after that, like, yeah, it's not fun without them anymore. <laughs> and that's how campaigns die. <laughs> mm, pretty much. Uh, but so you but you taught them the system, and they didn't need. Yeah, and I, I made sure I, I didn't. So it's like a grab. I think the, the biggest challenge for me was once again not to get frustrated that they weren't learning at the speed I wanted yeah. them to. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I think RPGs have gotten better about this in general, from oh, yeah. what I hear. 
because <laughs> I've, I've not been around. You you've experienced some of this firsthand, like through. I, do, I mean, Palladium, and uh, that Palladium. Oh, yeah, was you weren't you weren't frustrated yeah. that I didn't know the rules. You were just kind of laughing as I walked <laughs> through it. You were more like sergeants walking the private go through boot, <laughs> I saw laughing you... at that pain you used to feel. I, exactly, exactly. Yeah. I That's used not to feel quite the you... same thing. Like right. if if you're frustrated with someone not learning at your speed yeah. or not having the level of mastery, the the literal worst thing you can do is either like. Show off your mastery. Yeah. Show us to do it. It's not not as a model, but to be like, all right, I'm just going to go on without them. Right. Or to get frustrated and yell at them or something like that. Because right. yet again, you're going to yeah. turn them off harder than anything else. Right. Like it's it's the it's the old saying of like, if you truly love your position, you'll love it enough to discover the other person's position so you can convince them of your position. Like if you truly love your game, you're going to love it enough to tamp down your grognardiness. <laughs> to a level to where you can introduce it to somebody, like even if the setting isn't exactly right, or even if you're not doing the rules exactly right. Right. Uh, and it's the same thing if you're a player and you're trying a new system. Like if you want your GM to try new systems, you need to be nice when they get those rules wrong, as no. they are going to, because they're trying to retain 250 plus pages of information. <laughs> Which is like not, co and then I think Tom had a great idea in bringing out the handouts. Like that's the biggest thing you could do. Cheat sheets are great to introducing people to the system. Like, do you remember how, cheat, how many cheat sheets I had flown around the table when we started No Evil? Like the hacking tree cheat yeah. sheet, which we still mm -hmm. use. Uh, the big list of combat modifiers, which we've all memorized by now. Yeah, we have. Like exactly, but like, <laughs> but that's the thing. That's kind of amazing. Like that's an enormous amount of information to have flowing around your head. It's utterly useless, which is. Maybe a critique of the hobby, <laughs> like you know, like. But there's that's a huge amount of information, but you just learned through you know doing and utility and repetition. Uh, but eventually, you get all that kind of stuff, which is something that if you're not actively thinking about it, you will forget. You will forget how many hours you've logged into something when you're trying to teach it to somebody else. Yeah. No, I mean, I encounter that, too, because, like, I've sunk in, like, 200 hours, according to Steam, on Payday 2. And so I jump in a match, and somebody doesn't know how to stealth a particular level. And Payday 2 has very quirky mechanics, shall we say, about yeah. how uh, stealth works. There and, is little eternal logic yeah. as to how it works. Like, it it's is, trial and error. It, it's, well, there is a... There is, a, there, there the, is some. There there is some the game systems like, are hidden. There's It's kind of a black box thing, where yeah. if you don't know it, it do, the game doesn't tell you you can only page four guards. You can only kill four guards in a given level. Uh, it doesn't yeah. tell you certain things. It doesn't tell you what concealment means. Uh, it doesn't but, tell you, but it doesn't follow the logic of either reality or yeah. crime fiction. Right. Because in crime fiction, you can page more than four guards, or none at all, yeah, or anything that would make sense other right. than that arbitrary number. We're not, of four. Or, or the cops. The cops would stop sending guys in after the first fifty were killed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And criminals are not telepathic mutants who can come back from the dead after being yelled at. <laughs> exactly. It's yeah. it's a very yeah. much its own beast. Yes. Actually, I, back in the day when I still played WoW. Yeah. Actually, going on raids, it was a lot the same way. Especially yeah. if you didn't know the particular. But there are literally wizards in that that can alter reality by well, saying well, magic I'm words. I'm talking about you know if you're go going into a, a particular raid for the first time. Yeah. And you you look for someone who's a bit higher level who you think yeah. you know that that's going to determine whether you ever want to go on that raid again. Yeah. If you get someone that actually like hey I've, you say I've never done this before. Yeah. Like, oh okay well there's some things you need to know and right. Or there's also I've always experienced the guys like ah oh, geez like well try not to fall behind. Right. And the, the, I, I, I long stopped playing this, but when I did, like, if so, I got someone like that, like, not doing this one again. Fuck yeah, it. Yeah, for some reason, Emerson's education utopia in Co Connecticut survived, and you live there and have never had a bad educational experience in your life, and you want to see what this is like. Just buy a subscription to EVE Online and go. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just go on there and try and figure that bitch out. Do you speak like, from experience? No, I just like I just know like with the level of particulation in that game and like the flow charts and spreadsheets, spreadsheets and fan like you are not. It's not intended for you to go. And some people find that endlessly in people. Some people want that in their game. Right. Some people want to be thrown in, left to drown, and they want the. Not the achievement of beating the game, the achievement of beating the overwhelming odds at having learned the game. Right. And that is fine if that's what you want. You just have to understand that not everyone 
wants that level of and tabletop RPG should not be like that. No, but some are. Well, like, I mean, there should there should be in the sense that like. Once you play the game, your character has a very low life expectancy. It can be very dangerous. It should not, the challenge should not be like, how do I get this game to actually function? Mm. Like, it should not, it should never be that. It should be like, yes, if you're playing a hardcore dungeon crawl game where it's like Dark Souls, but worse, or the Tomb of Horrors or whatever, that's fine. But you should know how your wizard works and you shouldn't be killed by like a lack of system mastery. But I think like reading the first edition rules and stuff and scans online, that's how RPGs started. Well, and some people uh, yeah. like in figuring out that how the game was supposed to work based on the admittedly understanding rules because they were inventing an art form. Well, right. it would, it's well, not to be blamed. Is, yeah. But but uh, some people mistake that feeling of conquering it and making it playable yeah. as the game itself, which is not the same thing. Like, right. Um, and then you also have to understand that people's tolerances for this are drastically different. Yeah. Like. Some people, me included, uh, are going to find most fantasy games on the market just too much. Like, too much to get too fun. Like, I don't have time to hack through that to get to the fun. Like, and right. I can do that if somebody teach it to me, and I'd be fine with that. But, right. like, I have no desire to read through a book like that and figure out how to level every single monster for every little thing encounter because you have yeah. this particular feat. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. Pathfinder is definitely okay. oh god, and very yes. much in that model. I actually yeah. did back in the day. I for, almost forgot. I I had to teach some groups Palladium. Yeah, and uh, but the, that's okay. So that, the thing that, about that never the, worked or, out too well. Well, the thing is about Palladium and those earlier systems is that. Uh, for the large, like most of, Palladium's rules aren't very big. Like most of any Palladium book is going to be setting material, character mm. classes, g- gun guides. There's so many fucking guns and robots or whatever or spells. Mo- the rules themselves are pretty simple. And the thing is, they're they're very ambiguous and open ended. So like people inevitably house rule over them, and they're left so ambiguous that they're like. It's like the Talmud. It's like these scholars are arguing over the <laughs> intent of the words. Like, and that's sort of the appeal of that is that you. I just imagine a bunch of rabbis yeah. arguing over a copy of Riffs now. No, I mean, is, is that. Is there. Hands in the yeah. air, tearing at their clothes. It's not so different. If you've listened to some of these arguments and some of these stories talking about like physics majors using, you know, spells uh, in D&D to like. Uh, oh, well, they're underground, right? Well, we'll use this spell and this spell and this decanter of endless water to just drown everything in there. And then I get so much cubic force of blah, 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 using physics with D&D and stuff like that because it's so open-ended, it it allowed that kind of interpretation. So it was uh, open to rules lawyering and this this sort of school of argument, uh, but they weren't trying to be as... I mean, the first editions of D&D and like Chainmail are very thin. They're very small. And so it's, it's not... Um, it's only until like the mid and late eighties we get those like role master type charts for everything, critical failure tables for maneuvering, which could include walk going upstairs, so you could break your neck every ten thousand steps and shit like that. You know, like that's where you get that kind of stuff. And so it's it's an interesting, but I mean that's kind of a tangent anyway. So anyway, I mean I mean that's part of what makes the hobby great is that in those early yeah. days people were literally making it a game together. Like yes, yeah. Gary Gagax published a pamphlet. And then reading some of Designers and Dragons, which is out there. Mm-hmm. We should give that a shout out because Adam Jerry did it. Uh, but uh, Do you it, get – I thought the uh, you already got the PDF for it? Uh, yeah, I've been skimming through it. I haven't had a chance yet. Oh, I didn't uh, know they handed it out. I thought yeah, they were we'll going to wait until the Kickstarter. Uh, well, I, I think I saw a preview actually. Never mind. Okay. Um, but anyway – uh, part of the fun of that is like having like Gary Gygax publishes this pamphlet out of his basement and a bunch of people get it and they're just like how do we make this a game because like it hadn't been existed before so like yeah uh, I mean that's part of the hobby like that's an that's another good thing when lessons fail they don't have to fail like they can just fail to teach that specific thing. yeah um, like you can still have fun one of my uh, favorite stories of old old school d- game is actually not about Gary Gygax but Dave Arneson who is the co-creator of D&D and he mm-hmm. was a very much original rules lawyer kind of guy and like one of the sort of proto D&D RPG games it was actually sort of a uh, it was set in like in the, uh, a fictional 19 uh, country that was being uh, undergoing a revolution so like a rain or something like that and like the idea everybody had different assignments or like secret identities where they were trying to uh, fulfill some sort of agenda and Arneson 
was the CIA guy, and he was supposed to spread these pamphlets. He was given a big stack of pamphlets. This was kind of almost kind of like a LARP too. Like you would actually go around and talk to other players and like have secret meetings. So it was a little bit like diplomacy, a little bit like a LARP, and blah 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 blah. And so he didn't. He had this. He had a briefcase with him, and he had all these pamphlets in them. And and so they go through this game. Forget how it goes, but like by the end of it, he says, "All right, well, I go to the embassy and I get escaped by a helicopter. And as we're on the helicopter, I open up my briefcase and dump." all the pamphlets out mm. and so he wins because each pamphlet would count it as one point so he got like a thousand points for like just dumping for air dropping these pamphlets because <laughs> nobody had thought of a rule to specifically ban that kind of thing yeah. and that's mm. the kind of uh, create open ended like thinking outside the box sort of thing that I love I love about RPGs and so anyways um, I have, again just a tangent but <laughs> but also going back to history gaming um, but yeah so I think uh, there's a lot of fodder for talking about games as teaching tools and game or teaching games via the game itself, uh, but also games. You know, thinking about school and experience and improving your character. Um, there, 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 there does seem to be the this sort of debate. I think kind of one of the central premises is should characters improve during a game? Like, on one hand, you have the D and D game, which is very much the hero's quest. I start as a scrub peasant and I wind up as the dragon slaying hero who saves the kingdom and marries the princess versus like the world of darkness or call of Cthulhu game where I'm, I'm this person. I go on adventures. I maybe improve a little bit, but I'm more or less, I, my, my major changes are what happened to me. I don't become, I don't become president after I kill a few Shagas or whatever, you know, I'm still the professor from Armitage mm. and, there's there's very much a divide whether you have a static or dynamic dynamic character or like a you know what 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 is the growth is the growth your character's power or is your your character's story and there a lot of that kind of it seems to be what it boils down to in terms of games like whether they're on one side or the other like the world of dark is very much character story because character progression is very very slow in world of darkness and at nowhere near and like the games we play like close plays is kind of leaning towards that because you like you said you don't get many res points per session so um but yeah i i mean that might be another topic for another episode well i mean i think you do need it yeah but i think the speed at which you give it out yeah is going to be a direct impact on your setting and i think you always need to at least in some aspect tie together that skinner box yeah. stats improvement to the narrative and i think that the main problem in RPGs, as you keep seeming to point out, is when those are disconnected. Yeah. Is, is when that stat Skinner box improvement, which is just a basic need, like everyone at the table needs to be well fed and not tired enough that they're sleeping. And they need to be physically encouraged by what they're doing, by seeing those numbers go up and feeling those probabilities change. Yeah. To some degree, based on the fiction, like Call of Cthulhu. You play because you want to die, but uh, or read the book. You play because you 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 play because I want to play because I want to know the truth and then die. And that is Skinner yeah. Box. Yeah. Like, press the Shogoth button more, you get more plot. Like yeah. that is Skinner Box kind of in reinforcing. You need that for character advancement, and, but it needs to be some mix of story and stat. And when yeah. those are disconnected, like story ends now stats yeah. then it then it's a weaker form and i would just say that you put education in your games because it's going to make your world feel infinitely real because it's neglected from almost everything <laughs> in terms of setting like yeah. it, uh, like there's these massive settings that are made to exist that uh, and like economics how they perpetuate themselves or how they came to be other than thousands of years ago the lemurians like how anybody is going to keep this thing rolling along is almost entirely, you know, left out. And if you take care to think about that, yeah. even if your fantasy world is just forgotten realms with a new coat of paint, it's going to feel infinitely more real to your players in terms of world building because you thought that much yeah. into it. Yeah. Did you tell me any final words? Yeah, yeah I... I would say, yeah, yeah the, uh, the whole cliche of I kill orcs and I learn a language is a cliche for a reason. Yeah. And that's one of, the least, one of my least favorite things about all right. some games. Well, hopefully this discussion gives us all some ideas and you, the listeners, some ideas on how to get away from that cliche and insert some new cliches. It, because at RPPR, yeah. we're, no, we're, we're not for cliches, into, uh, except for the times we are. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> all right, so uh, no letter this week. Uh, but when we come back, we will have shout-outs and anecdotes. Hey, 
And we're back. And I think uh, for this episode, we are going to be using some vaporwave music, which I will be uh, choosing. Uh, I'll be talking about it a little later on. Uh, but anyway, so uh, shout outs. Uh, we have quite a few of them this episode. Uh, first off, I would like to mention uh, The Rhesus Chart, which is the newest novel in the Laundry series by Charles Stross. Uh, the Laundry, I know we've mentioned here before, is not only now a, uh, a setting, a, a series of novels, it's also an RPG, which mixes uh, British civil surface bureaucracies, uh, secret spy and espionage tropes, and the Cthulhu mythos. Uh, and, and math is magic. Math is magic. And Dilbert. And Dilbert, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, into a wonderful mix. And the research chart is no exception to it. I had a lot of fun with it. Uh, uh, it is talking about vampires, uh, their take on the vampire mythos. Uh, and it is the first novel in the laundry that is not directly imitating or a pastiche of a pre-existing uh, novel, you know, like the second novel, Jennifer Morg was a James Bond novel, mm-hmm. uh, basically. And so this is Stroh's doing his own thing. And I really enjoyed it with a few exceptions. Um, the first exception being, I don't, the, the sheer number of callbacks in this novel is ridiculous. Totally absurd. It is <laughs> just, I mean, it's like, we've been through four novels, you can, you don't, you can just edit half of those out and you'll still be yeah the the book should probably be a novella in length yeah if you cut out all of the callbacks like, yeah uh i know it's probably not that bad but it would it, it's it's real close <laughs> it's pretty it's pretty ridiculous like hey have you met i'm kind of like the eater of souls oh i'm the, the eater of souls. angleton is literally yeah. Yeah. in every book yeah. for the majority of the book yeah and they reintroduce us to a Every time, like he's just a brand new character. Yeah, uh, it's like it's like Howard has gotten like on fifty first dates amnesia. Yeah, every time he narrates, which might be a symptom of him. Ooh. No. But uh, and the other thing, they introduce a cute cat, which is that Bob picks up, and I'm like, oh god, it's so precious and cute. And it's it's clearly sweet. going to be a tie into something. It's goddamn, pretty sweet. Yeah. It's going to be a goddamn thing. Yeah. it's not going to be just a cat. It can't just be a cat. No, it's got to be a fucking goddamn thing. He's dedicated too much page count to it. So, But what I do like about it is yeah. that while the laundry has used its sort of uh, intensely dense and impenetrable bureaucracy as sort of a running <laughs> joke before, it that is the main yes, plot conveyance yes. of this novel. Like, I love it. I love it the is a war of forms. like And committees. Yeah, forms and committees like yeah. actively trying to destroy each other without any open conflict. Yeah. Like It is just like Oh, I will fuck her with this protocol on yeah. page 269, paragraph PQ. Yeah. Like, it is all just like, how do you bureaucracy each other to death? Which, in a laundry campaign, I would love to see a game where, like, the guns never come out. You never call Oculus. It's all requisition forms and committees and nepotism. See, and I, I don't feel I'd be qualified enough. I mean, I've never had enough firsthand suffering from bureaucracies to go through something like that. I would love to play something like that, too. But uh, I do need to run a laundry RPG. It is uh, quite a bit of fun. Uh, so, yeah, it's out. Uh, get it. I, yeah, I read it on I totally Kindle. I look forward to playing that. You know why? Why? That's a game I could actually get my dream. Oh, yeah, you could be a ghoul in that. that would because they be... actually have ghouls that work for them. Yes, uh, you could be a ghoul. Uh, that, that's so beautiful. So maybe we'll get... I think there's a supplement where they have where they talk about that, so I might have to pick that up. Oh, yeah, the, 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 yeah, there's the Department of Non-Human Resources. Right. Um, the night and night. you read the... You're, you're, you're not reading, you're going through the audio I'm listening to the audio book. Yeah. Uh, uh, narrated by Gideon Emery. He's very good. He does funny voices. Uh... Yeah, I'm a child like that. Uh, but he's he's the he's the best narrator of the laundry novels. I would I would read the other ones. Uh, uh, disappointed in the other narrators. <laughs> Um, next up, I would like to mention another novel, uh, since we had just brought up Gen Con. Uh, I got this novel free from the author, Matt Forback. It's called Deadly Games, How to Play. It is a murder mystery set at Gen Con and <laughs> features a number. In fact, the book's author, Matt Forback, is a character in his own novel, which I didn't know you could do. Oh, but Vonnegut did it. Yeah, okay. All right. Fair, good. fair enough. With just as much political, social, and moral commentary. <laughs> oh, yeah, no. It's about Liam Parker, who is a just graduated from police academy in Michigan, but is not yet a cop, and also a would-be game designer. He's going to Gen Con trying to sell his game, and he stumbles on a dead body. Some guy's got his throat cut, and he, he is hired on by Gen Con 
uh, because Ken Height uh, vouches for him, who's <laughs> character in the book. And uh, so he's liaison between Gen Con Incorporated and the police department to help solve this murder. And so... We laugh, but I think that might work. Yeah. yeah. If Ken Height vouched for me for pretty much any job... I'm sure. I'd listen to him. I Yeah, no, clearly. <laughs> uh, so... The it's it's a fun novel. It's I I mean it is really like airport literature though in that <laughs> sense that it's kind of like writing about it like it's a huge glamorous event and all these game designers it's huge glamorous people, but it's it's written like airport literature. Uh, but if Gen Con was a world like a big celebrity event and I don't know I it's it is pre- the premise is kind of goofy in of itself. Uh, I don't know. I, it is kind of a spoiler, but there's more than one murder, and they don't shut it down after the first murder, <laughs> and you're like, "What?" <laughs> so uh, there's two more novels. It's a trilogy, so I'm probably gonna get the second two at some point. Uh, the, the second <laughs> and third one, because I mean, more. I mean, curiosity. I just gotta know. I hope by three, it's just like that town and murder she wrote, just like bodies dropping on the I, daily. Okay, the, the, it's no- worth in South Chicago. <laughs> okay, so the second novel is called Deadly Games: How to Cheat, and the, the third novel is called Deadly Games. Games, how to win. <laughs> and so the third novel ends with armed gunmen taking hostages at the writer symposium. <laughs> and Liam Parker is You're not sh- gonna get a lot of ransom there, guys. Yeah. Just just say it. <laughs> but the thing is, Matt Forbeck has been to Gen Con for like 30 years, and he writes very I mean, like, I recognize all the shit in there, so if you kind of want to, it's actually kind of like a travelogue mm-hmm. about Gen Con. Oh god, yeah. I, some Hans Gruber type in the Billy like 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 due to Gen Con and Incorporated's legacy of plagiarism and nerdism around the globe, they're about to be taught. A I don't know. I, I'm so that's powerful. why I want to read it. That's why I'm just like, I, I you know, I, I'm just more curious. I can't wait for the parkour chase through the anime <laughs> hotel. Uh, there is a chasing in the first novel that was through True Dungeon, uh, no less. Uh, <laughs> Oh, that's even better. I know. Were they on segways? Oh, uh, no. Oh, damn. Well, but they do run, two they, more books. They use the animatronic dragon in it. I mean, like, <laughs> it's, it's a lot of fun. And the first novel is free. He was giving a giveaway. The other two uh, <laughs> Electrocuted actually in the, cost in money. Electrocuted the Battletech pods. <laughs> um, so, I don't know. I've had a lot of fun with it. So, it is, it is kind of goofy, though. So, um, you had a book that you want to mention, Caleb? Uh, yeah, I'm reading uh, Mike Carey's novel, The Girl with All the Gifts. Um, Mike Carey made Lucifer uh, as a writer for that. If oh, yeah, we, I love Lucifer. We've, yeah, I uh, love the ending. It's really good. Um, I... I'm tempted. I don't want to ruin it for people. Right. Uh, it is of a very familiar genre that we often talk about on this podcast, but it takes its premise entirely seriously. Uh, it's about a, a, a young girl uh, named Melanie that has renamed herself Pandora, and it's about her class every day that the soldiers take her to after they strap her down into the wheelchair and tie the neck restraints on. Uh, and she goes in this class with all these other highly restrained children, and then uh, she's got three teachers. She hates two of them, but she loves Miss Justinu. And so it's kind of like a love story, but not creepy or sexual or anything, but the love story that a child will have for a particular favorite teacher with uh, mashed up with these uh, really familiar genre tropes that you may recognize. Uh, but it is it makes for a very unique uh, unique reading experience. I haven't quite finished it yet, but I am uh, I'm enjoying it immensely so far. Nice, nice. I'm I'm dying of curiosity now. Oh, I love to open up that box. Yeah. So, uh, Tom, of course, you uh, mentioned that you've been having fun with the new the new Eclipse Phase release. Yeah, the one uh, the uh, Morph Recognition guy. Yes. Which um, I mean, the books. I think they do a great de- great job of describing the morph and all their abilities. But the thing that I always kind of bugged me is they don't often have pictures of all of them. Right. Well, and- I solved that. Yeah, they definitely solve that. So it's this. It's great to have all these, all the morphs in one one in one book. I like I I do like consolidation where you don't have to carry every book around with you. Yeah, um, I also really like the little bits that they added. They added like morph review guides to each or morph. Yeah, it's oh, like yeah. Yelp for bodies. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, this mod of kind of shit. Blah blah blah. You know, whatever. Um, and my I, I'm listening to the credits. They use some of my, uh, my morph material from. Uh, transhuman. In fact, some of the more all the morphs I created for transhuman were added in there, like the griefer, uh, Kafka. And, uh, the Samson, Sam Freeman is really creepy. Freeman, yeah, Freeman is really creepy. Uh, the Aya, uh, the nurse bot, and 
So I'm in the credits, so maybe I'll get a copy. Uh, yeah. I already got a PDF of it, so. Uh, but yeah, that's really cool. I, I've, uh, I've like looking through that too. Uh, I, of course, I also have to mention misquoting Jesus, as I mentioned earlier. It's a really good primer on biblical textual criticism. If you want to hear, read, like, you know, like the whole idea that the Bible is the inerrant word of God, and like it's a literal word of God, and blah blah blah. It's like, yeah, which edition are you talking about? You know, there's more than one, right? Which one? The King James version? That's based on a one that's on a, an 11th century uh, manuscript that's full of errors and holes in it. It's just like, yeah. Like, even the author himself is like, oh, I started out, I was like a hardcore Protestant. I was very, very, and then he, at the end of the book, like, there's a little interview. He's like, yeah, I'm agnostic now. I can't. I can't. The, the number of people who thinks that the King James Bible was written by God slitting yeah. on a cu- cloud chair, <laughs> riding on a cloud desk with cloud ink, <laughs> and then he just chucked it at some human's head <laughs> is absolutely mortifying. Like. It is, and it's it's fascinating. I mean, because uh, it's one of the foundations of Western civilization. So people should probably know what the fuck is the deal with it. The whole like the whole idea of like ancient literature, you know, like was meant to be read aloud, and you know, the uh, like the idea that you would read in silence was something the ancients like would be like, what the fuck is wrong with you, you know? <laughs> and I mean, there's a lot of good. Are the Vikings outside? Yeah. <laughs> we can- Wink if the Vikings are right. <laughs> So, there is, uh, a lot of good material there. You know, yeah, I mean, if the King James uh, Version was good enough for St. Paul, it's good enough for me, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, um, that's fun. Um, you mentioned, uh, uh, also speaking of history, uh, another history book that's uh, on Kickstarter right now. Yeah, Designers and Dragons, yeah. which uh, for people with hobby deficits, yeah. like myself, yeah. uh, are, is an enormously great project. Um, I saw some... Uh, evil hat project, I believe. Yes, and Adam Jury's doing the layout, layout who's the guy who do a clip space, so it's an absolutely <clears throat> beautiful book. Pretty. Uh, he did post some... I think I read previews on his okay. G Plus page. He was showing pages and cover uh, and stuff. Uh, and it just... It looks gorgeous. It's and four volumes, that too. It's four volumes. Um, I read a review, and it's supposed to be like really well organized. So like... The the decades are when the company or or originated. Sorry, yeah. uh, the decades are when the company originated, but it goes to the company to present day. So if like right. you're reading to like so like if you read TSR in the seventies, it will cover TSR until the nineties. It's not like you have to go to multiple volumes to look up your TSR. Uh, so and then the the decades also deal with general trends in gaming that originate in that decade so it seems like a really cool history I've been trying to get into more reading more history books Um, this seems like a great place to start Uh, and I'm excited to read them yeah Um, nice I've been wanting, you see, I've, I've, for a while I've been wanting to get at play with the world, which is another history of RPGs, which has been highly recommended by several people. I mean, uh, you've heard that, that Kickstarter for the Gary Gygax biopic thing. Is the di- documentary? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's two D&D documentaries. Yeah. Uh, in fact, what I heard, there's some sort of legal trouble between them two. Like the first one, there was a director and two executive producers, but the two producers left early on and started their own project, their own documentary and tried to kill the director's project, but there was some sort oh, of lawsuit. I thought this was about oh, to be yeah. real. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> this is like Game of Thrones shit here, man. Yeah, no, it's very... There can only be one. Uh, but that's been settled now. And the... Uh, they're going to be doing a screening of one of the D and D documentaries at Gen Con. So uh, winter is my, coming. Roll a D twenty. Uh, but I played the world. I've heard good things about that. I kind of want to get that too. And there's yeah, no, there's a lot of entry. I mean, like for me, one of my big interests starting an RPG was reading the history of RPGs. Our guide from Heroic Worlds, which I know I've mentioned on the podcast before, which is just a listing of all the RPGs that have come out and like little tidbits about the rules and stuff like that. And um, so yeah, this is uh, I, I, I I'm probably going to get the PDF level, ebook level. Uh, yeah, I can't afford the volumes. I would, yeah. I would like them, but yeah, yeah, yeah. money, uh, yeah, money. I will definitely get the eBooks. So, um, next up, I would like to mention the music uh, that I mentioned. Uh, there's uh, recently through the RPPR Tumblr, I've been looking through other Tumblrs. One of the things I've been doing is like looking for weird creepy pictures of buildings and ruins and stuff like that and tagging with architecture and reblogging and tagging as architecture ruins sort of like a style reference guide for ruin which will be the RPG I work on next uh, but through that I found this other blog um, Yetscape N-Y-E-T-Scape and he was Vaporwave Musician is well, was Vaporwave it's apparently this new mus- style subgenre of music which is a little like Boards of Canada but like 
I describe it as elevator music, but from Carcosa. It's like sort of mild and inoffensive, but Kenny G, but like he's in Carcosa, and it's just dissonant enough to be like out there. And I like Boards of Canada, so this is kind of up my alley. And uh, the, I'm linking to an album from Infinity Frequencies, and he has a, a Japanese DJ who's into vaporwave, and he's doing one call. Uh, this album's called Computer Death, and it's free. It's free download, so you can listen to it and see if you like it. So nice. That's off the of band camp. Um, Let's see here next up. Uh, I don't know if we mentioned Banshee Chapter before, but have you uh, gotten a chance to watch it yet, Tom? I've seen it. No. Um, that was when I mentioned that it's a horror movie based on a Lovecraft story from beyond, but it's set in the modern age, and one of the characters is basically Hunter Thompson. Uh, Ted Levine, basically. Yeah, you've mentioned it. Yeah, yeah. It's on Netflix right now. Uh, I don't want to mention anything else. It's found footage kind of. Well, it's not really found footage, uh, but it's really good. And well, I did watch it, a movie you recommended. Oh, which one was Devil's that? Past. Oh, yeah. I think I mentioned that before. Which is found footage. Yeah. It's, uh, it's in Russia. It's not quite as annoying. Mm. And like they, they tend to keep the camera still. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Banshee Chapter is one of those found footage films that is <laughs> eager to violate its own narrative premise as yeah. soon as possible. Like, yeah. <laughs> they will walk into a room for the first time, but there will be a camera inside the room yeah. watching them. It's, I'm just like, well, wait a... Yeah. Screw the pooch on that POV. Uh, but once you jump past that, it's a pretty enjoyable film for the yeah. most part. And if you have Netflix, you might as well watch it. Yeah, it's Thanks, free. Ned. Honestly, Thank the Ted Levine character is worth it alone. Because just like the idea of Hunter Thompson being in a horror movie. Uh, <laughs> Come on, yeah, dude, dude. If he was in Carcosa, would he know? Uh, that's kind of one of the things, yeah. posits of the film. Um, so finally, two video games I'd like to give brief mention. I know we've mentioned Bro for, Bro Force before, <laughs> uh, but they have a demo out now. I hate uh, you. Yeah, it's uh, they have a demo out now called Expendabros because it's an official <laughs> movie tie-in with Expendables Three, and the demo you can play all the. Uh, Expendabros uh, in it, and they each have different attacks, and it, it's free. What are you? What are you waiting What's for? What's wrong? Uh, what What character would you like to play, Ross, as you jump on the helicopter and leave us all to die? <laughs> I only do that like half the time. I only do that like every <laughs> single every, time. Every single time I can. not Sometimes you beat. You beat. It's not like you wouldn't do Did it. You literally just say as a defense, I only do it every single time I can. <laughs> that sounds <Yeah>. like Ross. <laughs> well, Jerry. <laughs> obviously, this. Can should be dismissed. Yeah, clearly. <laughs> because you're just as bad about it as I am. The, every time <laughs> I... car was right there, yeah. begging to be broken yeah. into. <laughs> exactly. Uh, finally, I would like to mention one game. Uh, it came out a little while ago, but I picked it up for the Steam Summer Sale. Finally got around to playing it and beating it. Uh, Brothers, A Tale of Two Sons. Uh, I've heard of that one. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. a sort of... Um, a Scandinavian game, a Scandinavian um, made game, and it's... Oh my god. Yeah, set in a sort of mythic... Uh, Nordic setting and there's no speech in the game the characters speak this made up language there's no subtitles but like their father's sick so there's a young brother and an old brother the old brother's like 17 and the other young brother's like 12 and they have to go up to the top of the mountain get to get a magic cure to save their father and the gimmick of the game is you control both brothers at once and you, you have to use a, a control stick to do that so like on the 360 stick you will have like your left control stick, thumbstick, will control the big brother, and the right one will control the little brother. And so you have to control them both at the same time. And Jesus. It's, I really like the story. I really like the setting. The controls got really fucking annoying. Not for that part, which was hard to control them because you like, like focus on one well, by like, the other like, one. Okay, like surgeon off. simulator yeah. difficult? Really? No, it's not that bad. What <laughs> The thing is there's a lot of climbing type puzzles and things that you have to do because you're getting to the top of the mountain and the thing is you would have to hold down the right or left trigger in order to have the brother hold on to something and so you have to hold it on the entire time he was climbing up the side of a cliff you can just toggle it to grab on and toggle it to let go and that got really fucking old to like oh go up 10 seconds oh the left brother you know fell down for some reason oh i gotta climb up another 10 seconds and so that got really annoying uh, but the setting's worth it. There's a couple of levels that are beautiful. Like there's one that's like a giant's battlefield where the, these corpses of dead giant warriors that like have arrows that are like the size of telephone poles. And like there are puzzles where you actually have to move body, you know, the corpses of the bodies around. Like both the brothers grab an arrow to push it the the arm out of the way so they can get past. Uh, and uh, puzzles of that kind of nature. And 
It's, so it's and it's only like three hours, so it's like it's worth playing. But I was really fucking annoyed by the the climbing controls. So if you can get a Ross control, was angry. Yeah, uh, clearly. Again, talking about frustration in mm-hmm. learning. You know, you got frustrated like uh, and it's a very Scandinavian in terms of tone and theme. Uh, I'll leave it at that in terms of uh, how uh, what kind of story it is. Um, but anyway, so yeah, that that's it for shout out. Nice. Yeah, anyway, anyway, with this. So anecdotes. Uh, we've been playing a close space again. Uh, we picked up duality. We've had. I'm doing this as sort of a chapter based thing where every p- locale is treated as a separate chapter. So we're doing the Titanian Commonwealth now, and the group had split up. Um, in one adventure, do you guys want to uh, uh, maybe Tom? Do you want to set the scene? No, I want to set the scene. Oh, oh you. I'm, I'm, all right. right, so. I'm trying to play a character that's less of a mastermind. It's not working. <laughs> uh, but I am I, my character is depressive in in the uh, in the game. So I'm trying not to be like totally proactive and like yeah. decide what the group does or anything. So we had all these factors in play and all these options and I I posited that like okay, I could do one option that's literally insanely dangerous. I'm just gonna walk into the heart of the enemy with no chance of rescue, certain death, tell a horribly bold faced lie, which I'm min max for doing. Uh, but if I don't make it, I will certainly die. Like it, it will be bad. And that was one option. And the other, we had another three options. So I'm like, if I do this, we're just gifting me. You guys can prepare. It'll be a huge payoff if it does. Or we could do these other things. So their decision is to well, we should split the difference. You go tell the crazy lie, and we'll go break into this corporate headquarters. So, the, well, well, it was a guy's. It was a guy. Yeah, a guy's Harvin that uh, had a corporate address. Uh, so, I go in. I tell the lie. It was three skill checks opposed. I had a moxie point. I made it. Uh, we got most everything we wanted. I walked out. Everything was cool. Like, <laughs> then we get to the actual break in, and yeah. So t- it well, was Tom, say, uh, David. First of all, for those who say that Tom never fails a role, <laughs> yeah, when this is up, give that a listen. <laughs> <laughs> what roles did you fail? I mean, it wasn't even the roles so much as the decisions. It really. Uh... <laughs> no, it's uh, I failed by quite failed quite a few roles, Ross. <laughs> but yes, I'm not saying that our decisions were, you know. Um, Genius. <laughs> this this crack squad is Aaron, David, and Tom. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and- so yeah, I remember. So in order to get in the apartment, they find a duct, uh, uh, some uh, that they can climb through. They can which easily- leads to a fabber. Yeah, which leads to like because in the future air ducts are man sized. Well, no, it was it wasn't an air duct. It was a duct to get fabber oh, material. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there actually was a reason for them to be that thing. It was right. like the robot yeah. servants have to be so kicked we, out yeah, of we sight. Crawled, yeah, we crawled through. We realize that, oh, shit, we're going to have to actually disassemble this fabric away well, from Well, you have to cut the power. It's basically bolted to the wall. You have to cut it out and push it out in order to which get Which we there. did. Yeah, which you did. But when you did, when you did that, it disconnected it from the grid, and which put up an alert. And so I, mentally, and I was like, in 10 minutes, a, a maintenance guy is going to come in to check on it. So And, of course, you know, we do that. And, um, and I tell you that, that that... that, that Faber will they'll know that it's been disconnected so yeah. anyway but that's it anyway and um so we uh, we get in there we disconnect the faber and we st- i do i do the one of the things my character is really good as i hack the server there's a server there uh disconnected from the mesh it's just a private but it has server. an AD, but it has an AGI. agi on it which it's very it's a very beefy server so like why does this guy have a private server and thing? but anyway so yeah i we so i hack that and um that's a, I'm hacking it, which is, which is the time then the maintenance guy shows up. Uh, yeah, well, Aaron and David are investigating the apartment. They mm-hmm. find some clues, um, and then they also find a wall safe. And the the, wall they safe, also, I like to, they are in uh, the uniform of yeah. the maintenance guys. Right, but because they, they spend their time doing that, we, nobody goes to like, oh, nobody thinks to act. And the main thing for me was, as a GM, was like, all right, I told them that when they disconnect the maker... It, they'll know about it. The, the, so they should think, oh, we should somehow maybe uh, take... Hey, it was a false alarm. Everything's fine. Right. Now. You should either try... You don't... And, oh, somebody who's tried to impersonate the guy, but none of you knew who that guy was. That was not me. I was... No, that was Aaron. Aaron. No, no. The, okay, so maintenance yeah. guy walks in. Yeah. Everyone... Everyone instantly freezes. 
Yeah. No, David pulls a gun. David pulls a gun. <laughs> and of course, Eric can't have that happening to a maintenance guy, even <laughs> though the setting has defeated death. <laughs> so he jumps in front of the gun to save the guy. Yeah. And then he starts intimidating him to be quiet. So he, he intimidates him. And then he starts trying to persuade him not to call the cops. And fails. <laughs> and then they fail Kinesix. So he's just like, no, I didn't, I didn't call the cops. <laughs> so then they're just chatting him up. Like, because they failed, or, which was the most realistic thing. Yeah. But they were still trying to metagame and intimidate him. Like, yeah. everyone was rolling intimidate yeah. rolls, which was my no, favorite. I was not. I which did was, not have it. Which was my favorite part, because <laughs> <laughs> David was literally holding a gun on the guy. Yeah. He is intimidating. <laughs> he was. <laughs> At which point, Aaron's like... Well, I'll intimidate. <laughs> so I was like, put that gun down. I want to kill him with my hands. <laughs> and then David's like, no, I'll intimidate him and get what I want. And then he will like push Aaron out of the side and be like, I am a god. Like, <laughs> and, I'm no. trying, and, then, and then I'm trying to cut a wall safe out of the wall. <laughs> yeah, you, you can't hack the no, server. No, you were still hacking the server. But it yeah. wasn't until the police showed up there. You're and like, then David <laughs> tasered him. Yeah. No, no, you, you said before, like, so... The guy, the maintenance guy, does call the cops. Yeah, and then they, he, Aaron and David are talking to the guy, dual intimidating yeah, him, dual despite intimidating. you saying just yeah. stop intimidating yeah. him. But the, like the guy called the police the instant the gun was pointed at him. Like his muse, it's his brain phone. Yeah, his muse just said, "Oh, call nine one one." Yeah. And so the cops show up a couple minutes later, and there's a knock on the door, and the guy's like, "Oh, there's someone at the door. Uh, we'll tell them to go away." Well, the heat sensors are. Uh, oh yeah, at this point they're like, oh shit, we need to get the wall safe out. Do you have, and they're trying to figure out how to get the wall safe. Nobody has any skills to do that. Uh, and there's like, hey, maintenance guy, do you have a plasma torch? Yeah? yeah so they're just like, fuck it, cut it open. <laughs> and at this point, Aaron's booking it. He's just <laughs> running at this point, I think. So, so at this point, I'm just commenting, because yeah. I'm not in the scene. No, Aaron didn't start running until after the and, 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 and I'm saying, right. and I'm saying, when they come in to investigate the scene, it's going to look like you're just vandals who tried to rip the copper wiring out of the walls. <laughs> Holes in the walls, open ducts, yeah. burn marks, yeah. a small fire going on in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> and so the cop come. they let the cop in because Aaron's trying to impersonate. The, no, they, at this point, he's trying to impersonate the person who lives there, but they don't know what Whom he, he's never met. He's never met. <laughs> we, heard his we, only, voice. we only briefly heard him talking in a language we didn't understand. Yeah, he was speaking the Scandinavian language. Uh, which none of them have, so he couldn't understand what he was saying. And so Aaron uh, spe- so fails. Is I wouldn't even love making an impersonation check because he doesn't doesn't have enough. It was, like, it was a minus fifty. Yeah, it was like a minus fifty. And I thought you were being generous. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you got enough moxie, I guess you could power through that. But uh, <laughs> befuddlement algorithm. <laughs> yeah. But the cop comes in, David, instead of trying to talk to him or whatever, just uses eel wear to shock the cop and tases him. Uh, and, then it's a st- and then it's basically a chase. No, they jump out the window. Yeah. No, first, that, that's when Aaron crawls back through the ducks. Yeah. Aaron crawls through the ducks. More cops come. Tom just Leroy Jenkins out of the window. <laughs> carrying then, the safe. Like and a- then it's a chase through the street carrying the safe. Yeah. Against like armed drones. Yeah, they make it. They 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 make, they make their checks. I said there. I, I didn't have many police there, so I didn't want to do an extended chase scene. And so they got made enough rolls to. But the cops were trying to shoot them down. Uh, but and they certainly have warrants on them now. But yeah, you got the safe. You don't know how to open it. <laughs> uh, but you you have the safe and yeah, you have some data. And that's what's important. Yeah. But if you had thought of a way to like. Hack the the well. You you were hacked out of the building mesh network, which is why uh, if you got an admin pri- uh, privileges or social engineered your way into disabling the well, building. Well, I didn't alarm. have social engineering, Ross. Well, that was because yeah. that's not what my character. But if, or if is. somebody stood outside the door to talk to the maintenance guy and you know uh, intercept him, then Ross, mistakes were made. Yeah. Okay, I'm I think saying. we all we all. It was lear- not an inevitable thing. No, we <laughs> all. But we. I think we all learned from our mistakes. You did, you which did. I believe is the whole point all of right, this episode. Fair um, Learning. <laughs> So I mean, we're probably going to repeat some of these mistakes. I, yeah, I question that whole line of reasoning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, but in other news, I'm running another campaign now. I've actually started Masks of Night of Lothotep. I've, uh, I ran the first session last week. I'm going to run the next one tomorrow as of this recording. Um, and before then, I'd run sort of three sessions of Trail of Cthulhu. I'd run Shanghai Bullets, and then I converted, uh, adapted the Dream Factory from Mortal Coils from Vagrant Publishing uh, into Trail. And what's 
what's great is this is with an entirely group, a new group. This is uh, Sean, Ann, uh, Bill, and Melissa, all from Hex Hollow. And what's great is they're they're really getting the spirit of the things. And Ann and Melissa are just like hooligans. They're like Ann is the most violent character in the group. She's the most quiet player, but she's the first one to gun down cultists uh, in any Good street. Good for her. Yeah. yeah, that's great. <laughs> and uh, Sean and Bill obsess over clues and minutia. Well, Sean is almost as bad as Aaron in terms of impulsive actions, uh, but he thinks he still thinks what he, because his character is a Catholic priest. He's like, is that guy Catholic? If he should, I want to. If he's a good Catholic, I want to be able to manipulate him. I'm like. <laughs> And that's what he he, he he literally asked what the religion of every single NPC is in this game. <laughs> Just to see if you're like, you know, he's Catholic, but he's not practicing. Damn. Uh, so which is so what, in modern terms, Catholic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but this is a 1920s game, so. Yeah. It's like, who are you, like, Protestant? I shoot him. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but what's great is because I'm adding in one thing I'm doing with this campaign, which I, I, I should probably do an episode on, is I'm making it more of a Frankenstein's monster in that I am not just being like the first time I ran a Master Night Loath Attack, I ran it as strictly from the book as I could and tried to adhere to the vision of the book. As, but now I'm just like, fuck it, I'm going to add all kinds of bullshit to it. And I'm adding material from Sins of the Slide of Handman. Uh, I'm adding stuff from uh, Trail of Cthulhu, like from the El- uh, Shanghai Bullets. Yeah. Uh, hey, Ross, you could do me a solid and have Grunwald in there. Uh, he might show up. He might show up. Where would he be in 1925? Well. Probably Europe. So imagine the London. Probably well, the London. All right, London. Maybe. All right, yeah, he could. Uh, he very well may show yeah. up. I, I support what you're doing in this yeah. campaign, but I just want to say that the Ross Payton mantra might as well be, and now I'm like, fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> we, could, uh, we could put that on T-shirts <laughs> with your smiling face underneath it, and that could be the first RVPR shirt. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I pre-plan everything. <laughs> I, I, I railroad players, don't you know? Oh, yeah, I, uh, all the time. Yeah, everything. Uh, you're all puppets dancing to my... Marionettes. I'm not just making up lies as, I, as soon as I, they come in my head. No, uh, okay, but it's been a great dance. Game. Yes, dance. dance for me, puppets. So uh, there's no particular one one shot except I will say in the first session of Mass and I looked up. I added some material of since the slide of hand man, uh, where the players got a hold of the accounting records of Mr. Lau, uh, and like, no, let's steal from him. And uh, so they and so they realized he had a dirty bank account. So they literally spent like an hour and a half figuring out how to con the bank out of giving them all the money from a dirty bank account. That's why we need an economics game. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, and it worked. Even games of nobly crusading against the outer dark yeah. turn into petty theft. Well, not, not It was more than petty theft. It was like a whole briefcase full of cash, and they blackmailed a banker. The Catholic <laughs> priest blackmailed the banker. Well, it could have been worse. <laughs> Mike, we have photos of you with your mistress. Please uh, yeah. give us the money. It could have been worse. could have been... Yeah. Uh, yeah, could been uh what was it groucho marx yeah oh uh, charlie chaplin charlie chaplin yeah yeah they haven't done anything like that it's trail of cthulhu <laughs> they get to they don't they they make spins they don't they, they uh they don't have uh. just because the characters have access full access to the plot <laughs> yeah doesn't mean they won't gun down charlie chaplin <laughs> all right no, i should probably throw him in there to see what happens there's so. a raw there's a proverb we can do <laughs> yeah so uh, that's that's the second RPPR shirt. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Well. I'm just going to continue making a non-existent t-shirt live. Oh, uh, hey, man, there's Zazzle. Uh, <laughs> start uploading logos. Uh, so, uh, well, that's been it for RPPR episode 103, School of Dice. I'm Ross nice. Payton. I'm Tom Church. I'm Caleb. Caleb. All right. And back no soul left behind. We'll see you guys next time. Peace. Here goes Caleb, destroyer of worlds. <laughs>